joining me live now here on First Edition is the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and uh, late notice, but thanks for joining us. Always good. You, uh, you were costing me in the building, I'm here. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> It's all legal in the press gallery, but uh, we've got some big issues Most to talk are, about. In experience. Yeah, indeed, they are. But uh, we remember 10 years ago, it seems like it uh, was yesterday, but that apology to the stolen generation and 10 years on, what, what's your assessment of where the, the closing the gap targets are at? Well, the events of 10 years ago were about two things. One was uh, a step forward in the national project of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and the importance of actually saying sorry. Uh, we should think about what it would be like if we'd refused and simply kept up this farce that we had done nothing wrong to Indigenous Australians in the previous 210 years of European settlement. But that was one part of it. The other part was the material stuff, closing the gap. Closing the gap in uh, the infant mortality rate with Indigenous babies. Closing the gap in ensuring that uh, four-year-olds from Indigenous communities had access to preschool that school attendance rates were going to approach normality compared with the rest of the country. The same with literacy and numeracy, year 12 completion rates, as well as unemployment and employment, and of course the big question of life expectancy. So my uh, aspiration at the time was to set hard targets, hard targets, because overcoming 210 years of disadvantage was a bloody hard thing. Yeah. And so when people say they're too hard and we're not on track to meet them all, I say, well, you know, so what? Um, the key thing is, based on what I see in the press reporting today, is that of the seven targets we set, we are on track to realise three of the seven. But in all of them, what you see is either some improvement, yeah. significant improvement, or a lot of improvement, if not full realisation of the target. So I say today, let's not bash the targets, let's enhance the targets. Uh, but we should not water them down, and this will require a consistency of political commitment, of policy effort, and of funding support. We can't simply allow this to flag. Yeah, well, you, you've had your criticisms of the, of the Turnbull government, but from what you've... One or two. Yeah, one or two, but in terms of this <laughs> issue, what, what are your views in relation to the commitment? Because obviously Mr Turnbull today will reiterate his commitment to the goals and to uh, setting some, some new targets for the next 10 years. Well, I always believe in waiting to see uh, what uh, the Prime Minister has to say. I'll be speaking to the National Press Club myself on this subject not long after. But the key thing is this. Uh, where you see the first major dip in federal funding commitment is in 2014, when the then Abbott government ripped a half a billion dollars out of core programs to deal with health and education. And they did so under the mask of this thing called the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, the IAS. But the second thing is this, you now see, frankly, over that period of time, the cessation of national partnership agreements, which we, the Commonwealth, I signed on the bottom line, signed with the states and territories in 2008, which began to expire in 1314, but the non-renewal of those in critical areas of health and education, and there's one coming up for renewal this year as well on housing. What the states and territories tell me is that the feds are now saying to them, no more money for Indigenous uh, remote housing. So my challenge therefore to Mr Turnbull uh, and to Scully and the Minister is having targets is one thing but if you're going to fall away in your financial commitment to the realisation of those targets then you're not going to get there because the states and territories will fall away as well. Full marks though to Ken Wyatt, the uh, Indigenous uh, Health Minister. Mm -hmm. I think Ken has been a strong voice within the government to try and pull a lot of this stuff out of the fire. So I think the fact that we're still on track with a number of targets Mr. Shorten, is because of him. Mr Shorten's going to announce a, a fund to help with compensation f hmm. for, for uh, descendants and, and members of the stolen generation to, re to recognise the intergenerational impact of this, of this issue in, in our past. Do you, do you think that that's a good move? Absolutely. In the 2013 election, you may remember, uh, apart from um, battling the daily fusillade against News Limited, uh, as I did during that campaign, uh, one of the uh, 
uh, commitments that I made was that we had to then begin a national conversation on a compensation fund for members of the stolen generation. I wanted to do this in two stages. One, the national apology. Two, closing the gap strategy for all Indigenous Australians, hence what we've been talking about in this interview. And then three, dealing with the individual members of the stolen generation as well. Unfortunately, we didn't prevail in the 13 election. I'm glad that Bill is um, stepping up to the plate now. Uh, he should also think about what we do with those states who may not be participating in compensation funds, quite apart from the two territories that he mentioned. It's uh, just coming up to 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time on First Edition. We're joined here by the uh, former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, on the 10th anniversary of, of closing the gap and, and the apology to the stolen generation. To some other issues now, and the government has, uh, well, there's been some mixed messages when it comes to, to China, from the criticism from Conchetta Fear of Andy Wells about the aid program to suggestions that the government might be embracing the Jim Mattis, the US Defence Secretary, his uh, strategy on uh, his strategic statement announced over, over Christmas. What's your view on the way the government's handling the matters in relation to Beijing? I think my core criticism is inconsistency. Um, we began uh, this period with uh, Mr Turnbull, um, and I focus on him because he's the Prime Minister, uh, with a series of attitudes uh, which uh, on, let's call it, the China relationship and the role of the Chinese community in Australia, uh, which I think um, frankly caused me to scratch my head. Uh, way back when he was leader of the um, uh, Liberal Party the first time round, he had an opportunity to uh, pass our then legislation to ban all foreign funding uh, for Australian political parties. He chose not to support that. He was a strong advocate of the Chinese telecommunications company Huawei becoming a full member of the um, uh, national broadband network uh, with the Australian government at the time, took a contrary view and he was not happy with that. Um, and more broadly, he was critical of what he saw to be far too hardline approach on the part of myself in the 2009 Defence White Paper. And the decisions about doubling the submarine fleet and increasing the surface fleet by a third come from that original white paper based on our strategic assessment of the region. But they're all so, historical criticisms. Yeah, but then I mean, we flip over to the current period and now we have uh, the, uh, the, the domestic political jihad launched by Turnbull on the back of the Sam Dastyari affair, which I think causes a lot of people to scratch their heads about um, the role of the Chinese community in Australia and certainly a lot of bruised feelings on the part of Chinese Australian citizens who now think they're all under watch and under scrutiny as to whether they are patriotic Australians or not. And I think the other thing is you now have I think far too uncritical approach uh, to the question of how you engage China in a balanced way in the region in the future. My view is pretty simple. That is with China we're dealing with a one-party state with an authoritarian political culture which represents a series of values which are quite different for those of us in a Western liberal democracy. I've always said that. At the same time, it's the biggest economy uh, in our region and the second biggest in the world, and we must therefore engage that economy as fully as we can without handing over the family silver, which is why in government we would regularly reject various foreign investment applications by the Chinese, often criticised for doing it. And thirdly, uh, be very clear about why we have an alliance with the United States, where it's grounded in the events of 1941, and not apologising for that without simply being an unthinking instrument of every element of US foreign and strategic How's policy. How's Admiral Harris, the, the new ambassador to Australia, announced as Donald Trump's nominee? He hasn't been confirmed by the Senate, but most likely will be. How will that be received in Beijing, given he is hawkish when it comes to Chinese assertiveness in the region? Oh, I think it's uh, the Chinese are already on the record as attacking uh, Harry Harris uh, uphill and down dale. That'll be water off a duck's back for Harry. Uh, I know him somewhat. Uh, we've met on a number of occasions. I think the great virtue that Harry brings to the table uh, is simply this, that he knows our region really well. He knows Australia well. Um, and, uh, and I think he'll be a good strategic partner. But I would say this uh, to Mr Turnbull and the government. Uh, we should always walk into every strategic conversation with the United States administration with eyes wide open in terms of where this ultimately lands. I've always been a robust defender of the US alliance. 
but never seeing that as, frankly, equating with compliance automatically with every element of US strategic policy. The last issue uh, relates to, to, to something which has been developing here in, in the last week or so in terms of the reporting around Barnaby and Joyce. D does Labor need to be careful about the way it responds to this? It's talking about taxpayer expenditure in relation to Mr Joyce's partner, but is it, is it a, a very, care, you know, cautious Labor Party that you would like to see in relation to this sort of matter? Well, Kieran, uh, politics is a brutal business. Uh, I've experienced a little bit of that brutality myself over the years. Uh, it's very hard on families, and therefore you'll understand why I would just choose not to engage in this discussion about um, uh, Barnaby Joyce's personal circumstances and his family, all members of his family. These are, these are very hard things. So I would simply wish uh, all the members of his family well in what is going to be a very hard and difficult time ahead. Mr Rudd, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Good to be with you.